God does not befriend him, but they are befriended by false ideologies, false gods, sometimes even nationalism, and this ism and that ism, and they become loyal to these ideologies, and these ideologies only take them away from enlightenment into darkness, from a position where they would believe in the good of everyone to a position where they would believe in the good of their in-group. And what is also important here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he's not just talking about believers, but he's talking about befriending these believers. So who are these believers? Who are these enlightened people? Who are they? What are the characteristics of these enlightened people? All religions, all religions use a lot of uh, play with the idea of light. So light and darkness are common metaphors uh, in discussion of religious books in nearly all religions that at least I know of. In the Quran itself and within the Muslim thought it also has special places. For example, you know of the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of the heavens and the earth. We also believe that perhaps the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was created from the light of God and therefore the universe is also created from that extended light of God. But who are these people who are enlightened and how do we recognize them? There are many ways. Across the world, you would find that God consistently refers to people who believe as people who think. People who believe as people who do, who use their reason. People who think as people who are enlightened. It has never separated intellectual development from a spiritual development. The Quran has always integrated intellectual development with spiritual development. For example, in verse 35 from chapter 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And God said that they certainly left a sign, a clear evidence for people who use reason. And I found here the way this, the verse is phrased quite fascinating. He says that God has left clear signs for those to perceive, but he uses it in a collective sense. How many are It is for those people, that tribe, that nation, that collective group which uses reason. The point that I'm trying to make here is that while individual reasoning is encouraged as part of spiritual growth, as part of enlightenment, God also speaks of reason in a collective sense. So how are we to use this collectively? We use our reason collectively through our public actions, through our institutions, through our politics, through our struggles for social justice. That is where we must use our public reason. That is where we must recognize that these two aspects of faith, which is a belief in God that comes from the heart, and the use of reason that comes from the brain, so to speak, is essential. You cannot separate one of the two, which also is another way of looking, that you cannot separate the realm of ibadat from the realm of muamalat. So you cannot be spiritually private and publicly inactive. You cannot be intelligent, thoughtful, and rational in matters of spirituality alone without using the same apple the same reason publicly. In Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very similar but in a slightly different way. I have talked about it before extensively from this member, so I will only briefly remind us, all of us about these two ayahs of Surah Al-Imran. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna fi khalqis samawati wal ard wa ikhtilaf al-layli wa nahari la ayat al-li Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, indeed, in the rotations of the day and the night, there are signs for those who understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually making for those who are scientists here an empirical argument. He says, look at this creation that I have created. Heavens and the earth, this is a really terrible translation of the Quranic ayah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have this samawat, wal earth. When he's talking about wal earth, it doesn't necessarily mean earth. It is everything that is materially existence. And when he's talking about Samawat, it is a realm of spirituality. The realm in which angels and God and heaven. And... So God has created these two realms and he expects that we reflect upon this. 
And he says there are signs in this for those of us who are the rule and bab. So who are these people who rule and bab, the people of understanding? Thou shalt not smoke pot. 
and there is no hadith which says thou shalt not smoke pot. But does it mean you can? No, the answer is no. Certainly not, young fellows. Even if it is legal, you are not allowed to smoke pot. And how do you do this? It's through the process of ishtihad. You go back and say, why did God forbid alcohol? You forget. Because it's not alcohol that is forbidden, it's intoxication that is forbidden. So anything that intoxicates you is forbidden. And if smoking pot intoxicates you, then that is also forbidden. This is how you do ishtihad. But this is a specific application of the practical side of ishtihad. Maslaha is a philosophical argument as which justifies the use of ishtihad. And clearly, it is not there in the Quran. There are attempts to extract, and I will give you one or two examples from the Quran, and you will realize that they are not exactly the verses which you would have thought validate and justify the use of the concept and the practice and the approach of Maslaha to Islamic law. However, the biggest example that Muslim scholars have given of the correct and justifiable use of the concept of public interest is the creation of the Khulafah. So as soon as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu died, we know that the Caliphate came into existence, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Rabbi Allah who became the first widely guided Caliph. There is no precedent. There is no command from the Prophet sallallahu on how to do it and what to do, what to call him. And there's nothing in the Quran. So how did this come about? Instantaneous ishtihad. Later on, Umar ibn Fadu radiallahu anhu, later on talks about it, that it just happened. And he was asked for it. He said it just happened. He was implying that there was divine guidance there. But nevertheless, this happening of this instantaneously, it happened because a significant majority of companions who were there recognized that the common good can only be pursued by the creation of an institution like the Khulafa. There are many other examples. For example, the most controversial aspect of Maslaha is the claim by scholars who advocate Maslaha. Uh, all three schools of Hanafi school of law uh, of a Sunni school of law, which is Hanafi, Maliki, and Hanbali, subscribe to the idea of Maslaha. Even Abdul Wahhab, the founder of what is now called Wahhabism, also resorted to the arguments based on Maslaha. <coughs> it's the Shafi'is who are very reluctant, but they also accept Maslaha in a slightly restrictive fashion. So, the most controversial aspect of this concept of Maslaha is the belief that the pursuit of the common good is so important, <coughs> so significant, and so necessary that we can even suspend the direct nas from the Sharia sources in pursuit. So, for example, if there is something in the Quran which specifically says do X, Y, Z, and there is something in the Hadith literature which explicitly says very clearly, unequivocally, there's no doubt about it, says do X, Y, Z. But if you perceive that at that moment in time it is against the public interest, then you can pursue what is in the public interest and suspend what is ordered in the religious text explicitly. And the example that is often cited by scholars who defend this is when Hazrat Umar suspended uh, the Hajj punishments during a famine. This is the Hajj punishment, as you know, is you cut off the hand of the thief and Hazrat Umar suspended that during a period of famine. So what he did was he used the philosophy of Maslaha, public interest, to suspend the specific commandments of the text. There is no other way you can explain why he did that. <coughs> and how did he do that? What is the Shara'i justification for that particular judgment? He did not abolish it. He temporarily put a moratorium on that particular hut punishment because of the context we live in. Later on, Imam al-Ghazali in the 11th century consolidated this concept and essentially said, he did something very fascinating, he tied it to the maqasid of Sharia. And uh, a lot of scholars since then have been saying that the purpose of Islamic Sharia, the reason why God revealed these divine laws, is to protect five things. So the purpose of Islamic Sharia, the maqasid of Islamic Sharia, is to protect five things. The first and the first one is deen, and then life, mal, that is your wealth, 
your nasak, which is your family, your relation, etc., and other. So the five things that the Sharia of Islam protects is life, property, association, uh, and religion. Now, these are the five things. So, and Imam al Ghazali argues that there are three ways in which you can protect them as a zaruriyat or hajiyat or tahsiniyat, as something that is necessary, something that is needful, and something that can be embellished. For example, in order to put, make sure that everybody's religion is protected, we will need to have a constitutional belief that there is such a thing as religious freedom. That would be the maslaha, the common good that people would do. So the way you protect people's religion is by giving them freedom to practice their faith. That would be under the Ruriyat. But if you want to also talk about desires, you could come up with specific laws saying that in the month of Ramadan when people are fasting, no company, no employer can prevent Muslims from working while they are fasting. So if you see that's the broader principle where you protect religion, then you get to specific laws to protect specific. And then you could also come up with a law and say that uh, Muslims are encouraged to give charity. So we would pass a law which says that those who give zakat, their zakat will be exempted from taxes, which is a way of the state encouraging. But the most important thing that came out of this concept of common good and maslaha is creation of the public sphere, the creation of the state through which we have these policies. And that is something that I want you all to think about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and this is uh, from uh, Surah 29 and verse 78, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Vajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadihi. Struggle in the path of God, and the word here is jihad, to do jihad. The struggle in the path of God as God deserves your struggle in his path. Vajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadihi, huwa ashtaba'akum wa ma ja'ala alaykum fiddin min kharata. But the second part of that verse is so fascinating. He says, and strive for God, strive in the path of God as he expects you to strive. And then he says, he has chosen for you a path that has not placed upon you a difficulty in your religion. So it's seemingly, it's a very interesting contradiction, sort of. It says that you should do your best, but also says it's not difficult on you, it's become easy. So there are several verses in the Quran where it says, like in uh, when the commandment for fasting came, that Allah does not expect to put you in burden. The last verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala does not burden his soul without first giving them the capacity to face that burden. All these questions, these comments in the Quran, which talk about the religion being easy, has been used by the ulama to justify the concept of maslaha, which means that they understood public interest as a way of articulating those rules, those laws, and those policies. So what is the Islamic definition of Maslaha Bursa? It's very simple. What it says is every action, every policy, every decision that people in power make in order to increase benefit and decrease harm. So there is a very important hadith. All of you probably know, La Dharar wa La Dharar. There is no harm done in Islam, and no harm should be responded. So neither should we do harm, nor should we stand by while harm is done. So the purpose of Islamic Sharia is to reduce harm and to increase benefit. So that is exactly what Maslaha becomes. So you make public policy with the explicit purpose of increasing the good of everyone and reducing the harm to everyone. It is the same as saying Amr bil Baruf wa Nahiyan il Munkar. The purpose of Islamic law, the purpose of Muslim activism, is to encourage good and forbid evil. So these are some of the principles that went out of. And I'm going to give you one example, another one, where this concept of unrestricted public interest maslaha was used. Again, uh, during the time of the Hulfa al Rashidun, the reason why we go and look for examples in that period is because most Muslims, as if Sunnis, 
do not contest the legitimacy of these policies, and therefore the philosophy is justified by the legitimacy of those specific policies. And one of them is the pension system that Hazrat uh, Umar instituted while he was a caliph. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulullah, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, inna allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabi, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Talking about public interest, I have to tell you that there is some rumor in this masjid that our elections last week were hacked by the Russians. Uh, we have no proof that Russia is involved, but we suspect that the Russians hacked our elections, so we are doing it again this week. Uh, those of you who took your ballots home and brought the ballots back, please give them to Dr. Naveed. Or, yeah, I think you should give to Dr. Naveed. Everybody else who is responsible in this budget is on the ballot, so it's not fair to give some of the contestants their ballot. If you forgot your ballot last time, doesn't matter. We have a lot of ballots there. You can see Dr. Naveed holding all the ballots. So, so go ahead there and do that. This is your moral duty, remember, participate in the elections. Because you attend this mosque, you are a member of this mosque, and so if decisions are made later on by this board and this committee for which you abstain from voting, and if those decisions are wrong and they are against the principles of Islam, and they are against the public good, then let me tell you, you are equally guilty. Because you could have participated, you could have become a voice, and you chose not to participate. You cannot choose to, to get out of the game. This is one thing that God has done. He's created this, this universe and thrown you, and you cannot say, God, I'm not going to play. That's not allowed. So you have to play, and uh, yes, whether you like the rules or not, do engage in it. Uh, this is a great opportunity. This is a new mask. Mashallah is going fast and rapidly. Participate in it. Shape the destiny of your community. Participate in it. Define what is the public good in this, not just in this. The Muslim community are Learn rapidly in the state of Delaware, we will be a political voice, we will become a social voice, we will become an important part of that culture. Don't stay out of it. There are two people, kinds of people, those who follow the stream and go wherever it goes, then there are those who become agents of change and they give direction to their time and to their society and I want all of you to do that. This committee will be participating in such decision making, so please seek to join. So why was I giving you a, such an abstract lecture on al Nasra? Because I feel that in our country today, we are compromising common good. In the United States, we don't have to sell the idea of common good, at least to the political theorists. The whole idea of a commonwealth is based on the idea of common good. In other parts of the world, when we talk of Sharia, sometimes we talk about what is good only for Muslims. But America is not based on what is only good for Christians or Jews. America based, is based on the idea of what is good for all of us. But unfortunately, when you look at gun laws, who in the world can say it is in the interest of the common good that people can buy 40 guns I mean, the man in Las Vegas, if he had waited three more weeks, he would have had silences legally available to him. The Congress was going to provide. He's not a lone wolf. People like him have been supported and enabled by our own Congress. We should make sure that it is as easy as possible to have these guns. Is it in the interest of the common good? No. So what is compromising this idea of the common good or this public interest? is that this country is now proliferating with special interests. Whether you're looking at guns, whether you're looking at health care, whether you're looking at foreign policy, any of the things which the world's richest country should be able to provide to its citizens, we find special interests constantly undermining public interest. I want the Muslims of America to also become a special interest whose goal is to pursue the common good. Listen to me again. 
I want American Muslims in this country to become a force for good, for the common good. We want you all to grow up and become a force for the common good. We are just 2% or less of this population. We need to be, become a force that will a special interest group whose goal is to achieve common good and public interest. That is our responsibility. We will have to answer God on the day of judgment as to what we do. We cannot remain bystanders. I don't know whether we heard this hadith. Every time there is a divorce in a neighborhood, God is going to hold 40 homes in each direction responsible for their divorce. So if you have a house and you have a divorce in this house, 40 homes in each direction God is going to hold on now that how did you allow this family to break? Now of course we have issues of privacy, etc. So I can't go and worry about that. But the philosophy is this, that if there is violence in Las Vegas or in Florida or elsewhere, even though we live in Delaware, God is going to hold us accountable and we will want to know what did we do to pursue the good? What did we do to make religion safe in this country? What did we do to protect people's life? What did we do to protect people's property? The five nakasid of the Sharia. So that is important. The whole point of talking about maslaha is to understand that maslaha is one of the most fundamental goals of Islamic Sharia, that is to encourage what is good and to forbid what is evil. Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahyan al munkar. So from an individual perspective, that is our manifestation. From a collective purpose, it is our job to make that which is beneficial stronger and that which harms collectively weaker. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the opportunity, the wisdom, the courage to become a force for the common good. I also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the intellect, the wisdom, and the hikmah to understand the true meaning of our faith and also understand the true responsibilities that our faith imposes on us as believers towards the rest of the world. God is very forgiving. He will forgive us if we have been lax in matters of ibadah. But I'm not very sure he will be as forgiving when it comes to Muhammad's. When there are people suffering in Myanmar, and we are sitting here and watching movies and doing nothing, I think we'll have to explain to God that God is going to say, I gave you safety, I gave you security, I gave you prosperity, I gave you voice, what did you do? I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he brings us all close to him. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu uskur wa hazikun kaseeran. Rabbana atayna fi dunya hasnatan wa fi al-akhirati wa hasnatan wa khina azab al-naar. Inna allaha ya'amru bilakli wa l-ihsan wa ita'li al-qurwa wa yanhani al-fashah wa yunkaru al-lari ya'izakum la'alakum tadakkaroon. Wa akhim al-salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ayya al-Salaam, ayya al-Salaam, ayya al-Falaam, ayya al-Falaam. Al-Qamad al-Salaam, al-Qamad al-Salaam. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, just a quick reminder and announcement. Uh, as uh, Dr. Mukhtar Khan already spoke about it, it is very important that you participate in this election. Um, I understand that you may not recognize all of these names, but that is also a, a, a point to think about that why do we not recognize these names? Uh, they were nominated, so they are known in the community. But if you do not know about it, it means you're not uh, here enough times to recognize who these people are. All of these people are good people. They, they are uh, accomplished individuals. And um, uh, you know, personally, I think they'll be, they'll be a great asset uh, for the community. But we need uh, your uh, word of approval uh, for that. So please make sure to return these uh, in the ballot box that we that we have uh, set up uh, on the table uh, by by the exit. Uh, inshallah. Also, sisters in the in the masjid, uh, sisters masjid, uh, you should have received um, uh, these ballot papers. Please make sure that you return it as well. We need your voice uh, as well. Your voice is just as important as anybody else's. Inshallah. Just after that.
sure people have fans to put their thumbs up. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ويقولون طاعة فإذا برزوا من عندك بيض طائفة منهم بيت طائفة منهم غير الذي تقول والله يكتب ما يبيتون فأعرض عنهم وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا أفلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا سمع الله لمن حمده
Allah السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
one to nine. One being the first choice for the for the year. Okay, okay. One being the first choice Ah. <sighs> 